we, uh, I want to talk about the invitation of heaven and uh, to talk about this in, I guess, the context of our worship and our practice. And I'd start over in Acts chapter 8 with you. And then we'll have a look as well in Acts oh, about 19, thereabouts. But we're starting in Acts chapter 8. Now, what you find in this latter half of the chapter is 26 down through the end, verse 40 there of Acts 8, that there's an evangelist named Philip, and the evangelist is sent to um, join up to this chariot traveling through the desert. In the chariot sits a man, a Jew, who is displaced, who is a, a eunuch in the, the palace in Ethiopia. But he's been in Jerusalem to worship, and he's on his way back, and he's reading the prophet Isaiah, and Isaiah, what we call Isaiah chapter 53, about Jesus, and asked Philip, who is this about? Right, That's where we are in the 34th verse of Acts 8. The eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, himself or somebody else? And the 35th verse tells us, very importantly, Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus, which is to say he evangelized him, the Christ. It means that he preached the gospel. Tell the good news is preach the gospel or evangelize. Those are exactly the same word. He preached the gospel of Jesus to him, or he told him the gospel of Jesus, the good news about Jesus starting from Isaiah 53, which is, as you know, like a sheep led to the slaughter, like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he doesn't open his mouth. And this passage about the suffering servant and the fact that he was sacrificed, that we might have forgiveness, that's where the eunuch is reading, and he says, about whom does he speak? And he, this Philip steps right in and tells him it's about Jesus. He's preaching the gospel to him. What is it to preach the gospel to him? What is the good news about Jesus? What does it mean, you know? Because what you find, in any case, is the 36th verse, as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? Well, now, hold on there at verse 36. I think somebody hit the fast-forward button because I thought he was talking to him about the gospel of Jesus. <laughs> he was. He gave him the gospel of Jesus, right? So how come the very next thing out of this guy's mouth on this record is, see, here's water. Well, what's water got to do with the gospel of Jesus? Here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? Well, what does being baptized have to do with the gospel of Jesus? Well, everything. Everything. It's the point. When we are teaching about Jesus, we're calling for everyone to fear God and to keep his commandments. And to follow him is to, to believe in him, but to change the heart, to decide I'm going to serve God from now on, and this turning of a new leaf, if you will, is followed up in the teaching of the Bible with this idea that we are baptized in water in the name of, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. When you, when you put together what Peter said in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins, and what Peter said in Acts 10, 48, who can forbid water, that these should be baptized and commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When you put that together, you realize, well, it makes perfect sense. Water is necessary for baptism in the name of Christ, and baptism in the name of Christ is necessary for forgiveness of sins. And he gave himself the sacrifice for our sins as recorded in Isaiah 53, but this actually is quite logical. It follows 
very easily. If the Bible is your guide, it makes perfect sense. Now, if you're thinking about your own religious background, your own religious traditions, what perhaps people have taught or said or done, well, there might be confusion there. That might be at variance with what God said in the Bible. But what the Bible says, this makes all the sense in the world. Of course, he would start with the sacrifice of Jesus to teach about the forgiveness of that is being effected by that sacrifice. And the means of getting that forgiveness is the change of heart and the repentance, uh, that repentance and the baptism in his name. And that requires water. It all makes perfect sense. And that's what they did. You know, they went down into the water, he, he baptized him, they came up out of the water. Uh, the Lord carried Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more, but the eunuch, verse 39, went on his way rejoicing. He had done what everything that needed to be done. He had to read, you know, to hear the word. He had to believe in the word. He had to change his heart to serve God, but he also had to obey him by being baptized in water for the forgiveness of his sins. And he had done that, so now he can go on his way rejoicing. Now Philip can part from him because he's finished. He did it. Not to say that's all there is to being a Christian, but to say he was saved. And that was what was necessary at the time. Now, the reason I say this is because the invitation is from God. The invitation is and has been for some time under attack. It is under attack and it has been um, for quite some time. It... Uh, you know, it first came to my attention, and I remember it quite well. It was 1994. I was a member of South Austin at that time, not the evangelist, um, but a member. And I attended a gospel meeting here in town at one of the other congregations, and um, the fellow speaking there had a, a very well-known and respected name, and, and um, you know, I thought it would be interesting, and Little did I know, it was uh, a little bit too interesting because on listening to this lesson, there was not a single mention of baptism for forgiveness of sins, of repentance. It was not mentioned. There was no, no indication that it should be done or that it, was, that it needed to be done. No reference to verses that taught baptism was required. When did I do this? Was this a class period? No, this was the Friday night of that gospel meeting, the last time that he would be preaching. Well, uh, was it a small group of people like we have here today, where he knows everybody there and he knows all of you are Christians? No, there was, I don't know, 100 plus and I had never set foot in that building before, and I had never met those people before, or that man. He had no idea who I was, just some guy off the street. Well, maybe he didn't see you uh, sitting on the front row. No, he did see me. <laughs> Not that I was trying to be seen. I have an attention problem, so I like to sit on the front row at a lecture because otherwise my mind will stray. <laughs> That's just the way it is. That's how I deal with ADHD. Okay. But no, that's not it, right? None of that is it. Well, he didn't give this invitation. He didn't tell people what to do to be saved from their sins, how to be forgiven, what they were required to do. Well, of course, I brought this up later and was told, uh, not, not with him. I, I went to dinner with a local evangelist, and, and I said to him, Brother, did you hear him talk about baptism, and immediately the guy jumps on me with, ah, you know, you're just being, you know, real nitpicky. And I was like, well, what do you mean? You know, he's, ah, you're, just, you're just being so tradition-bound and, and nitpicky about this. I was like, well, but this is a gospel meeting, right? I mean, don't you want people to obey the gospel? And doesn't that mean you have to tell them how to obey the gospel? Um, but that didn't go very well. And uh, so uh, later, <laughs> I, I mentioned it to 
uh, Tom Roberts, who, of course, did not appreciate what he was hearing, and said, uh, let me give you this brother's um, address. You write him a letter and tell him what you are saying. You know, the, 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 the preacher at that time, uh, the, the preacher who had done the meeting. Um, I was like, okay. So I did. I wrote the brother a letter saying, I was at your gospel meeting at such and such a place, such and such a time. You did not give an invitation. You didn't mention baptism at any point. I'd, I'd like to understand that, you know. Uh, and he wrote back saying, are you sure I didn't give an invitation? I thought that I had. And, you know, my dad told me that I needed to work on that. That's what he said. Um, of course, if you knew who I was talking about, you know who his dad is too. You know him and you know his dad. Uh, well, that's interesting, but it doesn't answer the question. And then, you know, years later, he held another meeting somewhere in the area, and I didn't attend it, but actually uh, Judy's husband attended it, and he talked to me about it afterwards saying, do you know this guy? I said, well, I've heard him before. He said, I went to hear him. Judy's husband said this to me. I went to hear him, and he didn't talk about baptism in this gospel meeting at any point. I went every night of that meeting, and he didn't talk about it. And I said, really? Well, actually, I'm not surprised. <laughs> and that was interesting. So it kept going, right? And then, years later, I met a brother who attended with this preacher years ago, decades ago, when he first started preaching, in the first place that he was preaching, in a different town. And he said, yeah, that guy doesn't give invitations on purpose. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he started doing that when he was preaching with us, you know, back in the 80s, I guess. I said, oh, really? Why? He said, well, he told us that he was going to stop doing it because it was just a human tradition and there, that he was just not going to follow human traditions and was not going to go with that. And so I was like, really? That is interesting. So he told you all that he was stopping and he was intentionally stopping. He was opposed to it, in fact, because it's a human invention. It's a human tradition. Like, yeah, absolutely. That's what he said. Like, oh, well, that's not what he told me when I asked him about it. Oh, well, that's interesting. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter about this guy, right? And that's why I'm not giving you the name, because it's not really that important. But the point is, that whole thing was on purpose, and the purpose was not biblical. That's what we're getting at. It made us think, or made me think, well, is it a human tradition? Is it just you know, something that we are doing because, you know, the Baptists have their call to, you know, their altar call, you know? Well, no, it's not, actually. And the passage that we have read is one of the reasons that I know it's not. You can see there in Acts 8, at verse 35, that Philip began with Isaiah 53 and preach the gospel of Jesus to him. And that in the very next verse, his response was, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Now, here's the, the exercise, and it's not that complicated, but I'm going to do it anyway. Here's the exercise. We weren't told exactly what Philip said. Don't know exactly what he taught. But we do know that when Philip was done teaching, at the end of that lesson, this man said, here is water, what now hinders me from being baptized? 
Is that the conclusion that this Ethiopian eunuch would have drawn if the brother who held the gospel meeting here and gave no invitation had been teaching that lesson then? Is that the conclusion he would have drawn? How would that eunuch have drawn the conclusion that he needs water and he needs to be baptized from a lesson that never mentions water and never mentions baptism? Well, the answer is he's not going to, right? It's fairly obvious that he won't draw that conclusion. But what is less obvious is what I'm pointing out to us here at verse 35. He told him the good news about Jesus. He evangelized him. He preached the gospel of Jesus to him. Do you know what that means? It means if you are not mentioning baptism, you are not preaching the gospel of Jesus. That's what that means. Right? Because if you were preaching the gospel of Jesus the same way that Philip was preaching the gospel of Jesus, your audience would draw the same conclusion. Here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Right? It's necessarily true. Whose idea was it then? that when you are preaching the gospel, it includes water and baptism. It's God's idea. It's right here in the book of the Acts. We didn't make this up. Now, is there tradition involved in an invitation? Well, there is in the sense that, you know, the method of delivery is not bound. There's nowhere you can point to in Scripture where it tells you when in the worship this has to be done. Nowhere you can point to where it says who is the person or what is the office that has to say this thing. It's not there. That's true. I'm told that in England, the song leader gives the invitation. That the person who's leading singing is different from the person who's doing the preaching. The person doing the preaching is expected to stop and hand it over to the brother leading singing. And that brother will give the invitation to obey the gospel. I was told this um, by a brother who didn't know that and gave the invitation and upset the congregation. <laughs> Which is kind of funny. Because I suspect if you went to this other fellow's home congregation and gave the invitation, they'd be upset with you. But not for the same reasons. So yeah, there's some tradition about that. Sure, it is, it's a matter of judgment about who has to do it, when do they have to do it. But how are you going to come together as God's people and not do it? How are you going to say you're preaching the gospel of Jesus and you don't mention this? You're assembled as the people of God on Friday night of a gospel meeting with more than 100 people in, in, in attendance and you never mention baptism, not one time. How is that possible? That's not scriptural at all. That's not the gospel. That's not what they did in the New Testament. Well, now, if you look with me at the other example that we're talking about, it's, like I say, right about... Um, oh, I said 19, didn't I? Well, it, that's right. It's right about 19, but it's actually... We go back into Acts 18 to start with. I want to look with you, uh, or look, yeah, with you together at Apollos, because he's pointing something out that we need to see and understand as well. Now, the record shows, Acts 18, beginning at verse 24, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, although he knew only the baptism of John. All right, let's stop there for a moment. He knows only the baptism of John. Why is that? Well, that's because of time. 
Where are we right here? We're in Ephesus. Ephesus is not in Jerusalem. It's not in Judea. <laughs> it's far away. This guy was in Jerusalem, in Judea, probably. He heard some of this teaching, and he knew the teaching of Jesus. It says here he was eloquent, competent in the Scriptures, instructed in the way of the Lord, and that he taught and spoke accurately things concerning Jesus. He's not some kind of false teacher who's covering up baptism of Jesus. He just has not. This is a time in history when the gospel hadn't fully spread. He was there for a time. Now he's over here in Ephesus, but he's teaching what he knew up to that point in time, and what he knew up to that point in time was accurate and correct and good. The Holy Spirit said so in Acts 18. But it was true. The rest of this had come out. He only knew about the baptism of John, meaning he didn't know, probably, about the resurrection of the Christ and certainly about the baptism of Jesus. He did not know about that because, well, he hadn't heard it and it hadn't been spread yet. This is the first time it's reaching Ephesus. He began, verse 26, to speak boldly in the synagogue. So that's incredible. A Jew, native of Alexandria, comes to Ephesus. He knows the scriptures. He knows the truth about Jesus up to a point. And he's so bold about this with only the teaching of John and what little he might know about the Gospels. He's so bold with that much information, or that little information, that he begins to speak in the synagogue. That's pretty cool. Now Priscilla and Aquila heard him and took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Priscilla and Aquila are Christians who have been baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins. They know about, they know about this. They know the rest of it. They hear this man teaching. What he's teaching is true. Accurate, correct, but it's not complete yet, only because of time. And when they heard his teaching and realized that it wasn't reaching the fullness, the, the, the final conclusion there, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God even more accurately. He went on, it says, to cross over to Greece. And the brothers encouraged him and wrote the disciples to welcome him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. Meaning he went to the church there and was a great help to those who had believed. What does it mean? It means that obviously he was baptized in the name of Christ. And now he's teaching the baptism of Christ. Why wouldn't he be? Of course he is. He powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that Christ was Jesus. But did you notice he spoke accurately? He said things that were true. Eloquent, competent, instructed in the way of the Lord, fervent in spirit. And yet, Despite the fact that he was eloquent, competent, instructed in the Lord, fervent in spirit, in spirit, accurately teaching about Jesus, despite all of this, Priscilla and Aquila, on hearing it, realized that something was missing. And they took him aside and told him, See, what this brother wants, who says, or anybody wants, who say the invitation is just a human tradition and you don't have to give it. They think Priscilla and Aquila should have left this guy alone. Why, what he said was true and accurate and correct. Why can't you just leave it alone? Why does he have to talk about baptism? That's their position, you see. Now, I haven't said that to me, but it's obvious that that's where they're going because that's what they want me to do. They want me to leave this fellow alone. 
who preached the gospel meeting and didn't mention baptism because what he said was good and true and accurate, or at least that's what they say. But you can't. For one thing, to preach the gospel of Jesus as Philip did, the audience has to draw the conclusion, look, here's water, what hinders me from being baptized? You can't be doing the same thing he did. And I'd like to think that you call yourself a preacher of the gospel, that the thing you do is preach the gospel, as Philip did. But another thing is, Priscilla and Aquila, who had been baptized in the name of Christ, realized that this man spoke accurately and yet didn't teach the baptism of Christ. They took him aside. They noticed it. It was a conspicuously absent thing that needed to be addressed, and they addressed it. When you go forward into the 19th chapter, you know, Apollos is going the other direction. Paul's coming this way. Paul comes to Ephesus. He finds disciples in Ephesus because they're the people who had been taught by Apollos. What do they know? They only knew what Apollos knew. Paul said to them at verse 2, did you receive the Holy Spirit? When you believed, they said no. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? You see that word then? Into what then were you baptized? If you're an underliner, <laughs> if you're a highlighter, put it on then, because that's the important word. Into what then were you baptized? What do you mean then? Since you haven't heard that there's a Holy Spirit, then what were you baptized into? Why would you ask that? It's because of Matthew 28, 18 through 20, isn't it? All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Bap to go forth, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, baptizing the nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. When Paul says, did you receive the Holy Spirit? He's, he's a step ahead. He's wondering if they need spiritual gifts to help shore up the Word of God, which, as we've just realized and, and witnessed earlier, hasn't completely traveled throughout the whole world yet. That's what spiritual gifts are for. It gives them the fullness of that Bible before the complete Bible had been finished and, and put together for us. And they said, no, we didn't even hear that there was a Holy Spirit. And he said, oh, well, then, what were you baptized into? Right? He's saying, oh, we need to back up a minute here. Let me start over. Why would you ask, what were you baptized into? Because it tells you who they are. Are they Christians? <laughs> they believe something about Jesus, and what they believe is true and accurate, but they haven't been baptized in the name of Christ. What were you baptized into? How does he know? Because of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You cannot be doing what Jesus said to do if you don't even know that there is a Holy Spirit. That was the tip-off for Paul. And he backed up and said, whoa, what then are we talking about? And the response is, John's baptism, which is exactly what we read in, in um, uh, 18, uh, verse 25. He knew only the baptism of John. So did they. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who is to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts 19.5. What does that tell you? It says that if you lived at that time that John was preaching and John was baptizing and before the gospel of Jesus had fully spread and everybody knew what they were being called on to do, you listened to John and he spoke the word and he spoke the truth. And his mission, according to the prophets, was to turn the hearts of the children to the fathers, to prepare the way of the Lord. 
Why do you think Apollo so readily accepted the baptism of Jesus so that he could be accepted by the Christians in the next place? Why do you think that these people in Ephesus so readily accepted the baptism of Jesus? It's because they were true believers. They were truly repentant. John's teaching had prepared them to obey the gospel of Jesus on hearing it. And as soon as they heard it, they were baptized, just like the Ethiopian eunuch. He was ready, and when he heard it, he did it. These were ready, and when they heard it, they did it. But Paul seems to have this odd preoccupation with baptism, doesn't he? Well, no, it's not odd if you know what the Scriptures teach about this. It is a very clear indicator of where you are and who you are. It's the act of obedience that leads to the start of that being a Christian, obtaining forgiveness of sins. That is the act in which you are forgiven and you are reborn and you are created a, cre a new creature in Christ Jesus, for, created in him for good works. That's the critical thing. It's not the case you know, in my own teaching, that I am bound by Church of Christ tradition. I was not raised in the church. I don't even know how that could be possible for me. I wasn't, haven't been around that long. The reason I, I like to think that the reason why I insist on teaching about baptism whenever we come together is because the New Testament insists on teaching about baptism whenever we come together. Everything that I can read in here is that what it is to preach the gospel includes baptism, is that this man who taught accurately still had to be taken aside and shown more accurately because what was missing was he only knew up to the baptism of John. He didn't know the baptism of Jesus. And in the very next episode, when Paul encountered those who had been taught by that man, they also knew only the baptism of John, and he immediately honed in on that. Wait, you don't know about the Holy Spirit? Well, then you weren't baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. What were you baptized into? Well, John's baptism. Ah, that's good. It is good. It's good. It's right. It's holy. But the reason is to get ready for the real baptism, the one baptism of Ephesians 4, of the one Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that is exactly what they did. He also honed in on that, you see. He saw that that's what this was about, that that was the, the, uh, the critical thing, the identifying characteristic. It told you what was at stake. Who are we really talking to? When are you a Christian? You are a Christian when you have done this, when you have obeyed the gospel of Jesus in baptism for forgiveness of sins. That's when you are a Christian. So where's the invitation from? From heaven or from man? Well, it's from heaven. Now, do we have to do it this way, where it has to be at the end of a sermon and it has to be given by the evangelist and it has to be given during, you know, yeah, during the lesson at that period? No, it doesn't have to be done that way. We could do that at the start of services, at the end of services. It could be given by some other teacher or brother here. It could be done in any of a number of ways because I don't read anywhere in Scripture where it has to be done some specific way, but I do read in Scripture that it has to be done. If we've come together and not done this, how can we say that we preach the gospel of Jesus the way that Philip preached the gospel of Jesus. If we've come together and done this, how can we say that we've spoken accurately about Jesus when Apollos had to be shown more accurately? 
How can we say that we have believed in him when they in Ephesus who had been baptized by John would subsequently come to believe in him and be baptized in him, in Jesus? Well, I don't think we can. I don't see a way in these verses for us to say that we have done that when we are not teaching what they were teaching. We are not binding what they were binding. Nobody should leave an assembly of God's people not knowing what to do to be right with God. How could we possibly leave people in that estate? You know, what's the likelihood of even coming to know the Word of God at all, of, of reading a Bible, of coming into contact with a Christian? And this one actually makes it into the assembly of the saints where God himself is being worshipped in the place where God is actually worshipped by his real people. How is the person going to walk away from that with no idea what to do to become a servant of God, to become a child of God, to obtain forgiveness of sins for themselves? How is that going to be the way it is? How is God going to be pleased with us if we have that happening? That can't be. It cannot be. And yeah, I guess uh, it's a little upsetting, although I'm not upset with these brethren or, or mad at them, you know, at least not in any way that's out, out of, uh, you know, out of kilter. Um, that's not the deal. The deal is we're supposed to be saving souls. We're supposed to be in the soul-saving business. We're supposed to be teaching the truth of the master and serving the master who called us. And we just can't be saying that that's what we're doing when we're not teaching what they taught. And it's really obvious when you look at the acts of the apostles that this is one of their acts. <laughs> you know? What were they doing? That's what acts of the apostles mean, what the apostles did. What did they do? They insisted on the teaching of baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Peter did it. Paul did it. Priscilla and Aquila did it. Philip the evangelist did it. It's everywhere. The churches that are opposed to this, that don't give these invitations, they're not doing so because of conviction from the Bible. They're not doing so because they saw this in the Word, where the apostles did it like this, the brethren did it like this, that you didn't see that. You didn't read that anywhere in Scripture. That's not what it says. That's not what they did. That's not why these people are doing it, why they're opposed to the invitation. Is there more than one reason they're opposed to it? There probably is. There probably is. There's probably a good bit of us and them. Like, you know, we know who we are, and we know who you are. We don't need that. And that thinking goes into it. But the fact is, you just don't know what's in people's hearts. You sh you've always got to proclaim what is right and good in the, in the eyes of God. You've got to proclaim the whole gospel. All right. So where is the invitation from? Well, it's from heaven. You know, like any other thing that we do in worship to God, we... we we do this, we, and we teach about this. And it's true, there, you know, we've already made arrangements. We've talked to the hotel about what can we do for water so that people can be baptized who choose to do so. Uh, that's true. We're ready for this, and we've made ready for this. If you are not a Christian, it's time to become a Christian, to be saved from your sins, to start the life of God. <coughs> we'll help you. If today you are a Christian but haven't lived right, repent. Come back to the doctrine of the Lord. Uphold the doctrine of the Lord. Hold your head up high in the presence of God in the midst of this crooked generation. If you need our prayers, we'll pray with you. If you need to be baptized, let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing.